Hello, welcome to another edition of Move It or Lose It podcast. So today you might have noticed that on my favorites for 2022, you have seen this man on my podcast. So I'm very excited to have Dr. Misha Kogan again, have him on and talk more about cannabis and how it helps and what it does for us. So Dr. Kogan, again, welcome to Move It or Lose It. We're happy to have you back on again. Thank you, Kat. Thank you. For, great to be thank here. you. It's um we left last time we had some more to do and it's just so refreshing to have someone like you on who deals with so many so many things when it comes to cannabis not just um for the MS um world but for so many others and there's so much that goes with it and I think there's still this um it's getting better but there's still this nervousness of oh I'm not sure if I can do this mm -hmm. um there's still this nervousness like I I can't be high. And yeah. there's not understanding that there's so much more that goes into this. Mm -hmm. And you and I have talked at length about that. And I still feel like I'm educating my clients and stuff like that, that you've, we've talked about my, the things that I do where I get on Amazon an empty capsule and I'll fill it with um, some CBD, CBN, CBG, things like that with a smaller amount of THC. And I may have to up it if I'm still feeling um, a lot of insomnia, mm -hmm. but I try to stay more away from the THC, not that depending on my sleep, mm -hmm. but we've talked about this before where it's too much THC can do the opposite where you're up and you're just kind of, oh, so talk to us about your, um, your, how you've dealt with pain management in cannabis. Yeah. So I, you know, there's a lot of, I think, I don't want to say misunderstanding, but I think there's some, a lot of magical thinking that somehow CBD is pain related, like a panacea and it's best. And I just don't see that. I actually right. feel like the patients who have a significant amount of pain and it doesn't even matter what kind of pain it is. There's a couple of exceptions. Um, pain from particular types of arthritis sometimes mm -hmm. responds really well to CBD and CBDA. Uh -huh. But, you know, musculoskeletal pain from spasms, mm -hmm. um, you know, any kind of motor symptoms of jerky kind of sudden movements, which can right. be uncomfortable or, or literally painful. Um, all those things, you really, this I don't really see CB, CBD play much role at all. Right, uh, right. In fact, in generally, I would say when patient comes to me with pain, regardless whether it's neuropathic pain, so the nerve pain or musculoskeletal pain, if we go towards the cannabis, usually to me, that means more THC. And right. sometimes I, well, usually there's some CBD in the mix, but most of the time it's a THC. Okay. I think there are two reasons for that. Mm. So one, um, I think is quite important one. Yes, you can treat certain things with CBD and CBDA, but you're going to have to titrate the doses a lot. Okay. It's not unusual for someone who comes to see me or, or even me trying this to give somebody hundreds of milligrams, like 200 milligrams right. of CBD or CBDA, mm -hmm. well, less of CBDA, but still. And, you know, that ends up being very expensive. Yeah. And I can at the same time give somebody 10, 20 milligrams of THC a day and completely control their pain right. as a fraction of the cost. Right. You know, now, of course, I'm in a state where my patients in the entire DMV, Maryland dis district and right. area can do can do that. They can get medical cannabis. But if somebody is in a state where they can't, now that changes a lot of things. Absolutely. You know, but and so what the way I do it, usually I would start with two or three times a day. Mm -hmm. I'd start patients with a typically sublingual drops, just a couple of drops first. Uh -huh. Now, if, if that's presumingly that they've never tried it before. Right? So that would be more in a tincture. A t it am I saying that? Okay. Oil, right. So okay. I, I like to use what your word oil because tincture uh -huh. include any liquid. So that yeah. could be alcohol, it could be oil. Right. Sure. So, but yeah, in, in, if you just look at the menu of dispensaries, mm -hmm. you'll be looking for tinctures there uh -huh. usually. But then inside of that, you I would tell patients to, well, I will help them and either me or my, or my cannabis co or our cannabis coach, uh -huh. Benavides, we would pick them an oil drops um, and then they'll start very low and then titrate up. Now, of course, some patients have smoked before, they right. have experience with vaping or smoking. And if that's what they start discussing, then I quickly can have them try something in sure. here. 
course, you know, you probably covered that already before that inhaled will work a lot faster. Right, so for sure. So the dose that needed is lower that way. Uh, right. So it's a vape in a cartridge, so you can actually can be, even be cheaper. So mm -hmm. now all those practical things play into it. Right. Uh, but the key aspect is titration. So you don't titrate fast. Um, it, sometimes when patients have a lot of pain, it's kind of hard to tell them, look, I know you're in pain, and but but I don't want you to start cranking up the dose quickly. So keep the dose low for a few days, for maybe three or five days. These are your favorite sayings you're going to say. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. In, you know, you, if you titrate up too quickly, right. go start low, go slow is a good right. Kind of I've got your voice playing in my head all the time now, but I think those are such good. Um, I mean, I, your mantras are so good because I think sometimes um, we have a lot of clients that I have that will go too fast right. and say, I, I can't do this again because I, I couldn't get up the next morning. And, it's, and in that case, it's very hard to convince them. Otherwise, they right. sort of get this mindset that, oh my God, it didn't work out. Right. And, you know, and that's, I actually think that some of the old statistics from, let's say, I don't know, eight to 10 years ago, mostly from Israel, where they would look at the patients who would be prescribed cannabis. Back then in Israel, all of the cannabis that was used this way was smoked. Right. Um, they didn't have vapes. They would just have flour, and that's what they were using. Sure. And so they'd go home and they try it, and there was not in Israel back then, there would, it, the whole country approved it and oncologists and other providers were recommending, but they were really not at that time cannabis clinicians. They were not telling, okay, you got to titrate this up. You got to get this strain. No, it was, right. just, it was kind of who gets what, what. Right, right. Really and was like the wild west. It was what, well, you know, it's yeah. just their system was before we knew so many details. Sure. Right? They were so early in the game and they realized the potency and benefits so quickly that they have kind right. of- they didn't let the market mature just sure. by the force of the market. And so they, the government basically just orchestrated the whole thing. Right. But so a lot we of- We know people, how well that works. <laughs> well, so they found that 50% of patients would not come back to it. Sure. I mean, that was the simple statistics. And when yeah. they asked them why you're not going back to the to using it, they were saying, look, I don't like side effects. Sure. You know, and then, and because the cost was not as much of an issue there. So right. So, it's a government control. The prices were, you know, relative. relative. We're here. It's it's a crazy amount. I mean, here it's, it's other way around. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, and I can see that where, you know, you've got as a as a patient, you've got all the costs of of your doctors, your medication, and then you want to get cannabis, and you can easily go once a week if it's like for me, it's the spasticity, it's the um the insomnia. I can easily spend two hundred dollars a week easily. Yeah. And if I'm really getting good products. Right. And so that's, I mean, that's really tough. You're talking about, gosh, I mean, well over a car payment in a month. That well, is, that's um, why, see, this is why I like THC more. And I think mm -hmm. because I find that people who spend a lot more, when I look at their mixes, there's a lot of CBD and other, other mm -hmm. hemp based products. Right. Those amounts of the material there that you have to take in or milligrams is so much higher than the THC. Um, you know, and also sometimes people don't realize that, but for some reason, there's this kind of, you know, even in our medical cannabis doctors or in, you know, cannabis doctors world, there's uh -huh. this kind of a idea that cannabis can fix everything. Yeah. It's just, that's just, it's one tool. And I keep telling right. everybody, it's just one tool. You have to learn how to combine it with so many other things right. out there, like acupuncture and, you know, my facial release and other body-based techniques. You know, there, there's so many other things, literally. And often, some things are so easy to fix. Right. You have the right team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that, that's, a, especially in, in, in case of MS, I find mm -hmm. it crazy that a lot of the times experienced neurologists would not refer their patients to like oh no I... therapists physical therapy like you think wait a second like do you even not realizing that the, the spasticity can be manually treated right they're like no we just give more drugs i'm like no i, I, I hear you but like i've not? only heard few neurologists um and none that i've had and i've had this over 20 something years 
And I study this. I mean, you know that I, I have podcasts about it and rarely do I have a neurologist come up and, and suggest it or even, um, and it's, it's very frustrating because, or I'll have a client come on and say, you know, all they do is CBD. And I'm like, well, you, if you want to drink it by the gallon, right. then you might, you may have some relief, but you've got to mix it with several things. And you may not. Because, right. you know, the, like th you have to think mechanistically, like, what are we doing with THC and CBD? Okay, so THC has uh, some analgesic and, and, and antispasticic problems. CBD is a very potent anti-inflammatory, neuroprotective, etc. But think of it this way. Okay, so if you have a particular type of spasticity and you're overusing the same group of muscles again and again, well, think what happens. Well, you end up with the muscles that are adjusted in a certain way, which often causes structural shifts. Mm -hmm. uh, the muscles that are counter muscle in the body will often end up either be too weak right. or simply will be in a constant uh, over lengthening or a spasm or right. shortening. Yes. You know, those are the manual problems. Right. We, I mean, cannabis has some role in there just right. to symptom relief, but you, it, it's not a fix. Right. Right. So let's say you've got a client coming, a patient coming in and they've got severe spasticity. Right. We talked about this a little bit in the beginning that you've either got like when I've got my clients that I'm training and I've got one person that leg just jets right out and won't come back right. and that's their spasticity. And then you've got several people that are like me where it's more the Charlie horses, uh -huh. the, you know, the cramping in the legs and sometimes the forearms or the jaw, things like that. So with those clients, you would recommend more THC. Correct. I would definitely recommend more THC. And then I will assess them first myself. So I would mm -hmm. I would check things and I would say, okay, well, so, you know, your, your spasm here feels this way to me. And so right. I would say, okay, I suspect that, let me give you an example. So somebody will come in and they will have a, a shoulder spasm. Uh -huh. And I would feel them. I say, you know what? Chances are it's your ribs. That's uh -huh. the biggest problem. It's not your shoulder. And, you know, and then I would send them. So, so this is the power of integrative medicine. So uh -huh. then I would send them to the integrative manual therapist who will manipulate the ribs, manipulate the shoulder. And then instead of sending them for physical therapy, they will give them a very specific exercise that uh -huh to strengthen the muscle that weakened that allowed for this pattern to to become steady. right and so it, it's kind of um you know well it, it goes hand in hand right it, it goes hand in hand yeah. because sometimes that won't work right you know, that they may have a something else going on right but you know but sometimes it will and i have probably seen dozens if not hundreds of cases where that was more important than cannabis right because patients will come back and say oh that was the whole cause of the entire pattern so right. now like this is better and my leg is better right and and often what find what i find fascinating is you know you would presume that in medical field um, neurologists particularly will understand all this referral right. patterns they don't no they really they don't really don't and I, I mean they understand referral patterns of certain types of pain like a certain sure. neuropathic components but once the things go musculoskeletal yeah the neurologist is the last person you want to go to That's, absolutely I mean I'm, I'm skeptical and I love neurologists I have my own whole team and network mm -hmm. of people I refer to but you have to know who knows what and who right knows. And, you, yeah. don't, you know, I, we don't get upset when somebody doesn't do something and doesn't right. know something. You just have to figure out how to get it done. Yes. So, and this is the, this is what, to me, the integrative medicine is. And the, and the cannabis fits there in, a, in, in one of the big boxes. I, right. I would say comfortably that the box is big. I would say that yeah. this, that box is probably as big as... Um, I think I'd be comfortable comparing it to something like a whole specialty, like okay. gastroenterology, because the, the the breadth of what we can do, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and that's how I think. Mm -hmm. You know, I would I would apply that as a tool. I would titrate it up. So let's let's come back to the pain, right? Mm -hmm. Let's come back to combination of two things. Let's come back to spasticity and neuropathic pain, right? right. So we know that particularly in the mess, if you have a especially if the spine starts to get affected when you start having different compressions and sure um you know and, and and muscles and muscles and contract when muscles contract quite often we have 
uh, nerves that begin to get yeah. pressed on. And so then you start getting this mixed picture where it's a spasm pain. So it's a muscle, muscle pain, but also you start having neuropathic components. Right. So those are the things where CHC is kind of must, I uh -huh. think, because you, you're just not going to have a better tool. Sure. Arguably have your neurologist put you on medications like gab right. gabapentin or, or pregabalin, the lyric, right. the rantin. But the reality is those are lousy. They can cause yes. side effects. So, so cannabis tend to be better. And also it's actually a milligram per milligram is way more. Right. So, so Dr. Kogan, my question would be if, so, you know, a lot of, a lot of my clients are on um, disability, things like that. But then I've got like another, you know, slew of clients that are still working. So how do we, mm -hmm. how do we do this? How do we, right put so much THC back in there right. and then have them not fall asleep at their desk. Right. How do we do that? Right. Um, so before we even tech, talk about that, right? So there's also the obvious issues, so which always comes up if you're working for federal government, that's one situation sure. if you get drug tested. So that gets really sticky. And I think let's table that because it's a hard discussion. Yeah. Um, so, well, there, there are two things. So one is consistency. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to um, yo-yo the dose. Right. Because once you start yo-yoing the dose, you're going to have periods when you're going to be low, when you're going to be potentially sure. high, where the pain may not get controlled, then you're going to compensate with taking too much, which we know chasing the pain is always the bad idea. Right. You always need to be ahead of the pain. That's a very important concept. You yeah. want to treat in the way that you try not to have it. Right. The moment it's escaped, you're 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 gonna have to give more. And often that's when people start overdosing and start having mm -hmm. side effects. When you found a good balance, ideally you would take it two or three times a day. It depends mm -hmm. on your metabolism, probably towards three times more often than two. Uh -huh. And you would take it in a doses that are steady. And they're mm -hmm. relatively low. Once you titrate it up, when you started low, went slow, and finally you got there. Right. That's when you stop. And let's say you up titrate the tincture from, I don't know, two milligrams or one milligram to say 10 milligrams twice a day. Let's just uh -huh. put that way. So, and that's working. Well, don't uh -huh. change it. It will keep on working. And then your job becomes to say, okay, my pain is better. I have some weaknesses. I have some spasticities. That's the point when you need to start adding other components. When you need okay. to start having a good physical therapist work with you. If you have an osteopath or, or manual therapist, like a physical therapist who does manipulation, well, awesome. Like that, that right. would be the best combo in there because mm -hmm. then those providers who understand your musculoskeletal structure right. will then help you to secure that success. Because unfortunately, especially with the mass as it progresses often, right, the, the pattern is going to start shifting. Sure. It may come in. And so you need to anticipate that. And that's why you have to really kind of stay ahead of the game, not, not right. behind it. Chasing the things is harder. That's right. general experience. So um, that's why the initial treatment should not just be aimed at, okay, I'm feeling a little better. I'm done. Right. No, no that's, that's not how it works. Right. Um, but but that's a general approach. And and you know, it's and let's say I titrate it up just THC with a little right. bit. Sometimes I start adding other things in there. Uh -huh. so I would say, okay, well, what kind of other components of this pain? Uh, is there an inflammatory component? Right. right. So there's often is. Sure. That's when the CBDA may come really strong in play. Right. Because as you know, like a lot of a lot of the clients, a lot of, of patients will have in the autoimmune world. Right. Like first I was diagnosed with rheumatoid, then MS, now epilepsy. So as you know, with autoimmune stuff, a lot of them, you know, you don't get one, you'll eventually get another one. So then you're looking at so with MS, for example, rheumatoid and MS typically don't go together, right. but I just happen to be an overachiever. So I have three. So with that, then you really have to look at things like this because medication wise, you really can't take very much for rheumatoid when you have MS. Right. So that's when things like this and food become very, very crucial. Very crucial. And like all anti-inflammatory spices and low dose naltrexone becomes yes. So you know, you start adding those things one at a, one or two at a time, and you gradually figure out where the response is good. If there is no response, you drop that off and mm -hmm. you keep on kind of, you keep finding synergism. 
I, right. I think that the whole point of integrative medicine is to say, okay, the problems are never simple. They're never singular. Like, like it's wonderful. You well, now we're watching this new Amsterdam. I don't know if you start watching right. that. Not so yet. Like, the problems are always like one problem. Okay, we fix this and patient result. Like right. it's it's a it's a beautiful fairy tale, which never right. Ends. The problems are always complex. Right. And so there's more than one driver for pretty much everything. And, yes. And so you're finding the ways into the system with sure. addressing the drivers in the in the sequence. The hard part is the sequence. Right. How do you prioritize certain things? That's right. where the art comes in. Learning what do you do for particular drivers is not a rocket science. I mean, give you an example. If you have a very strong anti pro-inflammatory state, like mm -hmm. right, you have a couple of different autoimmune conditions and you're quite inflamed continuously. Okay, anti-inflammatory diet, herbs anti-inflammatory herbs, fatty acids, low-dose naltrexone, uh, fix, like if there's particular triggers for inflammation on uh, the musculoskeletal level, sure. work therapist to fix that. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's an extra weight, try to get off of it. If you're toxic, right. get off, you know, try to figure out where the toxicity comes from, detox, et cetera. So like you do all these things, um, right. th then the trick is, we want to do everything in a perfect right. world and we want to do it all together, but that's sure. not <laughs> right. how life works, right? So you have to prioritize. And so the prioritization based on either symptoms because someone is suffering or right. based if they're, if they're tolerating process, then it's based on the clinician experience and clinician prioritization. Mm -hmm. And and that's when the, that's when the difficult part comes in. Like, right. I, if you ask me right now, okay, well, we have patient with this. I, I, I wouldn't be able to be precise. Simply sure. Because I'd say, look, there are 25 other things I need to. Right. Need to so look. that goes to my next question before we go on to some other things. So mm -hmm. we've got states that we know that are it's legal. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then how do we find that doctor that's going to be able to treat us? Like someone like you that um, where do we find that? Because I know for me getting, you know, my license and stuff, the doctor that I saw mm -hmm. probably knew less than I did. So where do we find a doctor that's reputable? I was like, yikes. Right. So how do we find that so there, in there our different couple, states? A couple of different ways. So if you're in a medical state, I kind uh -huh. of often find that dispensaries often know the best because they understand who comes to them and they know very well who's in a local area who does this well. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid asking in dispensary, well, like I'm looking for somebody to help me with this recommendations continuously, who is doing this here? Um, you know, that's one. Definitely some organizations. So the Cannabis Clinicians, the Society of Cannabis Clinicians is a good one. It's nonprofit. I'm going to stay away from giving any commercial um, mm -hmm. recs because yeah. there's so many for-profit entities now right. that are pushing agendas. And so I, I just want to be fair that, you know, I'm not associated with any of them, you know, and I don't, I don't want to keep it that way. That's right. why I'm staying academic because I, right. at the end of the day, unfortunately, this field, just in the way, like many other fields in right. medicine is, is really just filled with people making a profit here, yeah. and putting that profit over all other priorities, which yeah. you know, I, I don't want to be associated with that. Yeah. So, you know, Leafly in a, in a way has some information, but I find it that a lot of patients have a hard time finding through there. Yes. You know, and they are commercial after all, but yeah. they're good. I mean, they're big. And so you can yeah. get a lot of information there. And I'll put that at the bottom of the show notes as well. Yeah. Yeah. But I, you know, the, the, the stick with the organizations that are non -pro, non for profit. And what was that just for me again? The nonprofit was what? Well, the one that I know really yeah. well because I helped with some curricular development there is called Society for Cannabis Clinicians. Okay. It's not the only one. There are a few other ones that are um, claiming to be nonprofit. I don't know them necessarily very okay. well, but that's a starting okay. point. Yeah, but I know I that's tell, great. I usually tell everybody, stick with like, go to the dispensary. Uh -huh. Don't be afraid of asking them. They're okay. probably going to know better mm -hmm. than what you will be able to find on internet because whatever you're going to find on internet, you're going to find that information that's presented to you the way that internet wants you to see it right you go to dispensary and you can ask very specific practical questions you can right. say this who do you see who's like me coming to you and who is their provider 
Right. And and that often triggers cascade of correct directions and correct questions and answers and, and often leads to now what do you do if somebody is not physically <laughs> local? Okay, well then you reach out to some online organizations, you can reach out to us. Right. So we, do you have it so that if I wanted to see you, yeah, I can see you. Yeah. And I have a system where not every state, but most of the state, we have this collaborative agreement with um, organization where we basically have, we work closely with the very knowledgeable nurses uh -huh. um, who will help you. And, you know, so that's, okay. a, um, and actually I can't even give you their names. So that they yeah. are, it's acute on chronic is, is the name of the company. So it's run by a nurse with a very large experience and they're in many states uh -huh. um, and so that's and and also we cover most of the states now what yeah. we won't be able to do for everybody is if they're in a legal state where we uh -huh. don't have a presence we won't be able to give the card okay so that would be a problem but that's not a but if you can find a provider to get a card which is right easier much easier yeah. a good recommendation then we can work with Anybody. Now, is this go along the same lines as like the CIPAC thing or for doctors or no? Is that different? Where no, you can, okay. Yeah, that, that's different. I mean, okay. yeah, usually, usually what I tell to everybody is this uh, before you get a card, uh -huh. you have to try to get a sense of what's happening on a holistic or integrative level. Right. Uh, quite often, what I see happen is <clears throat> the, the treating physician would say, okay, you got this symptom get cannabis for this symptom but there is has not been any thought processes to okay what is driving this symptom right I oh mean, for sure yeah people often think oh i have ms so it's driving my symptom. right no it is not it is it's this fallacy of thought process yeah. basically saying the same way as okay well i have a cancer so that means that I should go get a chemotherapy because I have a cancer because because I need to kill the cancer. Right. Well, why do you have a cancer? Did, right. Did, yeah. So and often when you start asking questions this way, <clears throat> you help the patient to realize, wait a second, you can do way, way, way right. more about what problem you have. Right. Simply take the symptom management tool. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. I'm right. the first person, after all, I am a palliative care doc on top of right. everything else I do. And so palliating symptoms is crucial i'm the first one who was going to talk about this but the reality is you can never fix the problem until you try to understand why it's there in the first place right that, in medicine in medicine i think the biggest problem in medicine that happened happened 100 years ago or so when we got got gotten on this idea that diagnosis is everything Yes, that is the, the the worst thing that happened to medicine. Diagnosis yeah. is a superficial understanding of the problem. It is only the first step in realizing how you're going to make someone better. Right. And I, I hate the word cure because it, it it has no meaning in reality. Right. You know, it cure means that you suppress the problem so you don't see it. Right. And like with cancer, we're curing the cancer. No, we're not. What we're doing is we're killing it. We're making it go away for a period. Uh -huh. of time. And then we cross hope, quote unquote, hope that it'll, that that's it's gone. Right. We know the reality is that it, the, the driver that led to the cancer didn't right. go anywhere. Right. You simply, it's a magical thinking. Now you sit there and you hope that it won't come back. Right. I think in the future, when next generations will look back to us, they'll be like, "Oh my God, like, <laughs> they were practicing bar barbarism." Right. It'll, Agree. Because I don't think that they get to the root of anything anymore. It's just treat here, here, medication, medicated, medicated. But let me give you a, a very important point here, because I think it's important. So we do know with MS, with Parkinson, with Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. the endogenous tone of cannabis of, and the cannabinoid system. So our own production of cannabis-like molecules or THC-like molecules begins, to, <clears throat> goes down. Right. Why that happens I don't want to discuss because I actually, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know a lot mm -hmm. of things from that perspective. Um, I, I know a little bit in Alzheimer's disease why that happens, but I actually don't know why that happens in Parkinson. Probably the same reason. There are certain mechanisms that begin to, for whatever reason, deteriorate. And so it turns out when we take an exogenous cannabinoids, particularly THC, mm -hmm. we are addressing that internal deficiency. Mm -hmm. So that I like. 
So yeah. I like when I can look at something and say, okay, well, we have a process that is driven by a deficiency in the nutrient and the cannabinoid system, whatever. And, and I can, or inflammatory response, I can work on that. So right. instead of me saying, okay, I'm going to just treat your symptom, I'm going to work on that. On, on, on that. Now, right. we don't measure the tone at the moment. Like I don't have a lab to order to say, okay, we're going to check this. We're going to titrate it to the point of, we don't have that. Mm -hmm. That's the future. I mean, we have some genetics that are beginning to appear where I can check someone's SNPs for particular, for, C, for both CR1, mm -hmm. CR2, for the receptors and say, you know, okay, uh, sorry, CB1, CB2, so cannabinoid receptors. Uh -huh. But we still don't know what exactly that means. I mean, we can right. think there, that may be the underlying part of the problem. But again, it's it's too early to say, okay, let's test everybody. Uh, but that's what's next. What next is we're going to understand the disruption and we're going to try to really address the root cause of it with our external plan-based tool, mm -hmm. which which is the best I think we can offer. You know, right. Instead of uh, disrupting this medically with a medication that generally much harsher and generally right. shifts the balance too much. Right. And yes, it could be an important step stone in uh, mm -hmm. getting there, but but it's rarely the only step because yeah. doing it that way, generally speaking, you're going to end up with side effects that you're going to have to manage. Sure. And, or it's simply not everything. Right. Absolutely. And I think that it, I'm sure for you, but for me, it's always um, so crazy that, you know, you've got patients that will go to the neurologist and they'll switch the medications that bring crazy side effects. Mm -hmm. And they know that, and they'll keep going back. But the idea of, of cannabis is so frightening. And I'm like, you're going to have, I mean, we've talked about this before. I went through several, you know, not knowing what I was doing to get to a point where I felt like, okay, I have some relief in this, some relief in that, where, you know, there were times that I would have to teach early and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't do this. And so it was it, having no doctor, nothing, no one to tell me, just learning on my own. It was like, well, I've done this with medication for years, trying something and not working. And we're not afraid of that. So many of, you know, people that have autoimmune diseases. You have to find your team. Yes. You know, and so in the book, in the medical Marana, yes, we put the whole chapter there. Which I was going to say, and I always tell people, if you've not read that book, the best part about it is, A, you can get it, you know, you can order it on Amazon or whatever, but you can also, it's, it's on Audible. So for those of us who can't see well, there's no reason. It's a great book. I've gone over it a million times. Um, I was, uh, that was like when we signed a contract, I said it has to be an audible. We have I have patients who would not be able to read it. Even. Correct. And there were sure. So that I mean uh, that's the beauty of the world we are in. We we certain things are much easier than they used to be. So oh gosh, yeah. I think that's critical. I think the other big component of all of this is finding the team often requires, unfortunately, in this day and age a significant resources. Yeah. And that's the problem that unfortunately, and that's, you know, one of the part of why I'm on academia, I want to find the ways of figuring this out so that it's just. Right. Fortunately, right now, it's completely unjust. Right. You have money, you have some resources, you'll get it. And if you don't, there's just no way to find right. the ways of, you know, that's actually why I take insurances because mm -hmm. I felt strongly that, I want to make sure that I can treat everybody the same. Right. That's good to know because there's so many that don't. And then you're, you're just feeling like, you know, for me, example there, I'm in the middle of uh, not a, a fight, but in the middle of a, of campaigning that you'll, you'll do physical therapy, you know, the, all the MS, the big things, but you won't cover or help out with exercise, even though it states you need to have this much exercise. So those of us like me who've trained and have worked to get this to help our autoimmune clients, that's not covered. But physical therapy will be covered endlessly, even though they they go past that and now they need to exercise. And, often, and unfortunately, like 
So for example, yeah, I take insurance through the university, but then in my own practice, I cannot take it. it it's yes. sustainable. Um, and so like the best physical therapist I work with, she doesn't take insurance either because, yeah. because the, what she does is actually not what insurance allows her right. to do. She is not going to give you an exercise. She's going to do the manipulation. She's going to adjust right. your tissue. And then she's either going to send you to her exercise specialist or right. give you particular exercises, but they are not your typical physical right. therapy exercises. They're quite right. different. And so insurance will not pay for this. So we I'm also- sure it's very similar to the stuff that I do with my clients because they're not doing typical things. Right. We're doing things, like you said, to manipulate a shoulder that's not working, things like that. And it is it is frustrating because there you is- can't be, it's not insurance thing. And, you know, and I, I, that's why I think I stuck with the academia and I started uh-huh. trying to figure out, can we go to a certain direction where sure. we will figure this out? I think we can. Yeah. And I think we can do it thoughtfully and slowly and we're mm-hmm. doing pilots. And I think there's a lot of things happening. I think the, the sort of academic integrative medicine, uh, particularly consortium of um, academic health centers for integrative medicine is the one that pushes the envelope for uh-huh. um but it's a, it's a very slow process you know yeah. unfortunately academia and insurance is things moving too slow like i'll give yeah. you an example we worked endlessly right at the beginning and before the COVID uh with this dc medicaid to try to incorporate acupuncture and massage and you know what we've learned is they were keep saying yes 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 but when right. the things start coming to the practicalities how do you actually implement the billing and all this everything right. part right the problem is not that people don't want to do certain things the problem sure. is there is a massive train on the track right and telling this train wait a second your track does not include everything you and and the and the train is like oh we don't care because <laughs> we can't stop moving right. uh, but it's actually up to us to decide right. where the train is going it, yeah. it's a collect. But it's hard. It's hard. It is hard. A lot of momentum. There's a lot of, there's also a lot of unfortunate industry influences, right? Yes. They don't want to lose their comfortable lifestyle. They don't sure. want to the procedures that generate crazy amount of money. And sure. Often, absolutely. And often completely unevidenced. Yeah. Yet, because there's a lobbying for it, these things are happening. Or I'm not. Oh, even for talking, sure. I'm not even talking about pharma. That's a. Right. Yeah, I know. I hear, I hear you. I mean, doing this as long as activating as long as, you know, being an activist, as long as I've been, it's like, you see things and you're just like, what? And it, it makes you crazy. 